So welcome to Breaking Ground. We've got Mayor here to speak to us about the ever-shifting habits of cloud malware campaigns. But before we get started, we want to thank some of our sponsors, Adobe, Prisma Cloud, Sem Group, Blue Cat, Nudge, all out in the vendor area for you to check out with some pretty cool swag with some of them, all of them. <laughs> all right, cell phones. These talks are being live streamed, so we ask that you do not take pictures or keep your phone on silent. If you want to take photos of this slide, that's okay. Please be careful with um, taking photos for of other people. After we finish, there's going to be some time for Q&A, so please be sure to hold those until the end. And with that, let's Great. get started. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk. Um, so before we get started on the agenda for today, I'd like to first introduce myself. So I'm Matt Muir, and I'm the Threat Research Lead for Cado Security. Prior to working at Cado, I was a macOS malware researcher for several years, and I also have a background in DevOps engineering and digital forensics. So I've published several blogs detailing research into new and emerging malware families conducted by myself and my colleagues at the R&D team at Cado. I've spoken about this research at various conferences, including Black Hat EU, B-Sides, and Gurkhan. So this is actually my second time speaking at B-Sides Las Vegas, the first time being last year. And I'm very grateful to the organizers for having me back once again. So for anyone interested in our research or in cloud security in general, you can follow me on Twitter, or X as it's now known, at the handle on screen. I'll also be answering any questions as mentioned previously. So let's move on to the agenda for today. So anyone that was at my talk last year will likely remember that I focused on two distinct malware families. These families were named CoinStomp and ABCBot, and we'd been tracking them over the course of 2022. Now, given that I was eventually invited back to B-Sides LV, it seems like this formula was something of a success, and therefore I've decided to do a similar talk this time, but covering two new campaigns. Both of these campaigns were discovered and analyzed over the course of the past year. So the first of these campaigns is a family of cloud-focused hack tools named Legion, whose purpose is to harvest credentials for various SMTP services and hijack them for spamming purposes. So we'll take a look at some of the more interesting features of Legion, including the tool's ability to, to persist in AWS environments, and the tool's exploitation of AWS, SES, and other cloud-based SMTP services. I'll then move on to discuss DICOT, who are an emerging cryptojacking group, whose payloads that we discovered after detecting an interesting attack pattern on one of our cloud honeypots. So we'll take a look at a specific DICOT campaign that leveraged multiple interlinked binary payloads, which of course resulted in lots of complaints sorry, during analysis. So we'll also discuss some of the group's objectives, including their propensity for doxing and deployment of botnet agents on target hosts. And finally, I'll wrap up the session with some observations and predictions for cloud and general Linux malware before giving you the chance to, answer, uh, to ask any questions. So as you've probably gathered, there's quite a lot to cover here. So we'll dive straight in with our first family, Legion. So to give everyone a quick overview, Legion is written in Python and designed to exploit misconfigured web servers for the purpose of harvesting credentials. The tool automates the process of gathering these credentials which provide access to cloud-based SMTP services. Legion will then attempt to access these services and even send test emails on behalf of the operator in preparation for spamming campaigns. Now, since it's written in Python and contains no obfuscation, Legion executables aren't particularly difficult to analyze. One slightly annoying thing about them is that they tend to be in the region of 21,000 lines long which makes me think that the developers have yet to learn the concept of modularity. So I'm being careful not to use the term malware too much with Legion, as although it is technically malicious software, 
It doesn't infect the user's own machine or attempt to obscure its functionality in any way. For this reason, we personally would class this as a hack tool, given that it's used to facilitate cyber attacks rather than to conduct them. So acknowledging this, Legion contains some features that you might expect from traditional hack tools, included bundled exploits for conducting RCE on servers running Apache and PHP, and the ability to conduct target enumeration via Shodan providing you supply a likely stolen API key. So the tool also contains some AWS specific features, which is what made it interesting to us in the first place. If it manages to successfully retrieve AWS credentials from targeted servers, it will then automate the process of inserting a backdoor into the AWS account, acting as a persistence mechanism. Rather interestingly, Legion also contains a very rudimentary AWS credential brute forcing feature, the efficacy of which is dubious but entertaining to analyze nonetheless. So before moving on to discuss the functionality of Legion, let's discuss its distribution method and some details that we uncovered about the background of this hack tool. After first encountering Legion, we managed to trace its origins back to a public Telegram group using an embedded Telegram group ID extracted from the primary payload. It soon came up, became apparent to us that this group was being used to advertise and sell the malware to potential operators. At the time we accessed it, the group had around 1,090 members and had been active since February 2021. Now, Either that's a lot of people interested in exploiting cloud services to conduct malware campaigns, or it's a lot of overly enthusiastic malware researchers. So along with the embedded Telegram group ID, the original Legion sample we encountered also contained references to a Telegram user named MyLegion. From strings seen in the sample, we assumed that MyLegion was actually the developer behind the tool. So we examined messages in the Telegram group to see if we could find any discussion authored by this user. When we did access the group, we expected to find the MyLegion user listed as the group's admin. Instead, there were actually several messages from the real admin warning users of scams being conducted by the MyLegion user. So the admin didn't provide any context, but it appears that the copy of Legion we encountered was being illegitimately circulated by the MyLegion user. So from this Telegram group, we discovered a YouTube channel with the name Forza Tools, which included several tutorials for using Legion. Forza Tools also happened to be the username of the real admin warning members about the MyLegion scammer. So from this, we concluded that Legion was likely a paid hack tool distributed and sold by the user Forza Tools. So with that background out of the way, let's focus on Legion's functionality. Legion is highly opportunistic and relies on serious misconfigurations in target web servers for the majority of its functionality. However, that isn't to say it's unlikely to succeed. As I'm sure most of you know, these types of configurations are common methods of initial access, particularly in cloud environments. So Legion is designed to target servers running a variety of common web technologies. These include content management systems and web applications based on pure PHP or frameworks such as Laravel. Its core functionality is to identify these servers and attempt to retrieve application secrets from them. Once targets are identified, GET requests are sent to resources at a number of hard-coded paths. And this determines whether or not resources located at these paths are publicly accessible. So these resources include things like PHP info scripts and environment files, which have the potential to include application secrets. If the tool successfully retrieves any of these files, it will then run a series of regular expressions over the contents to extract credentials for various web servers. 
web services, sorry. You can see an example of the files themselves in the table on this slide. So one of the services specifically targeted by Legion is Twilio. And for those of you that don't know, Twilio are a company that develop tools for automating communications methods. So these, this includes things like programmatically making phone calls, sending or receiving SMS messages, and other forms of communication. So here's a code snippet from Legion showing how the malware scrapes Twilio secrets from exfiltrated credential files. Now there's nothing particularly fancy going on here, just simple regular expressions for Twilio secrets embedded in the credential files that the tool targets. So one of these regular expressions targets Twilio string identifiers or SIDs. SIDs are 34 character identifiers that are used to query specific Twilio resources via their API. Typically they're prefixed with two characters allowing you to identify the resource type. Now Legion doesn't seem particularly concerned with any specific resource type and instead just grabs any value assigned to the Twilio SID environment variable. It also does the same for the Twilio token environment variable which is likely used to store an authorization token. So if successful, any extracted credentials are saved to a file and reported to the operator via standard out. Now we've already mentioned Legion's deliberate targeting of AWS and this slide demonstrates the method taken to extract credentials for further exploitation. In this example, we can see the tool utilizing a similar process as the one described previously, but this time attempting to retrieve an AWS secret access key ID and corresponding secret access key from any exfiltrated environment files. Legion assumes that these credentials will be stored under the AWS access key ID and AWS secret access key NVARs respectively. Now this is a safe assumption as this convention appears in many AWS tutorials and sample code. Of course, it relies on another series of regular expression to discover these secrets and save them for later use. So I'll give you a quick overview of all of the services targeted by Legion before moving on to discuss the AWS specific functionality in some more detail. So on this slide is a list including the majority of services targeted by Legion. So if you're at all familiar with these services, you'll recognize that they're either cloud storage services, payment services, or communications platforms. And this gives us some insight into the motivation behind the development of this hack tool. It also supports our theory that the primary use for Legion is to access these services for spamming purposes, which we'll come back to. So now that we've covered the credential exfiltration aspect of Legion, let's move on to discuss some of the AWS specific features that are relevant to those of us working in cloud security. So before we get stuck into this, I want to give a big shout out to Ian Al from Permiso. So Ian noticed an earlier variant of Legion and posted some interesting information about the persistence mechanism on LinkedIn prior to our discovery of the sample. He also wrote a really interesting blog about some of the AWS functionality that Legion exhibited and collaborated with us on a blog for the first sample that we discovered. So I'd highly recommend reading his take on it. Now, as we've already discussed, Legion attempts to scrape AWS secret access keys from misconfigured web servers and applications. Given that this method is particularly opportunistic, the tool also includes a failback option. In the event that no AWS credentials are discovered in retrieved environment files, users are offered the option to brute force AWS credentials using a simple generator function. And we'll cover this in more detail in a coming slide. So I've already mentioned the tool's ability to provide the operator with persistent access to an AWS environment. And as you might imagine, Legion achieves this by creating a malicious IAM user and inserting it into the target AWS account using the stolen credentials from the previous stage. 
An attacker created IAM group is also added to the account to which the malicious user is added. On top of that, the infamous AWS Administrator Access Managed Policy is then attached to this group, and the IAM user ultimately inherits the permissions associated with this policy. So with all of this in place, Legion can perform automated actions with Amazon's simple email service or SES. So let's have a look at some code examples of this. So first of all, let's take a look at Legion's AWS Credential Brute Forcer. Now before discussing this, I think it's worth stressing the brute forcing AWS credentials in this manner is incredibly unlikely to be successful. I won't attempt to calculate the probability of success with this method, but you can probably imagine that it will be very low. So as you can see on the slide here, the function simply builds up a list of 16 alphanumeric characters and appends them to the AKIA prefix. Now for those of you that don't know, the AKIA prefix is used for long-term credentials reserved for IAM users or the account's root user. So this procedure results in a string resembling a valid AWS access key ID. Once this is created, an AWS secret access key is created using a similar method, resulting in a credential pair in a valid format. So Legion logs the number of AWS keys that it creates using this method and writes them to a file for later use. Now Lacework posted an analysis of a similar malware or hack tool family that they named Androx Ghost. Androx Ghost included a similar brute forcing function and Lacework concluded that its inclusion was likely a novelty more than anything else. And we would agree with this, given how statistically unlikely this procedure is to succeed. Now, on to some slightly more serious functionality. So I mentioned already that Legion enables persistence in AWS environments. To achieve this, the tool uses credentials stolen from the environment file enumeration stage and creates an IAM user with the username SES underscore Legion. So Ian from Permiso noticed that earlier variants neglected to tag this newly created user, providing a detection opportunity for defenders. However, in the sample that we encountered, we, as we can see on the slide here, this newly created user is assigned a tag with the key owner and a hard-coded value of MS Boharis. It's possible that this was added in reaction to Ian's posts on detecting Legion activity by hunting for new IAM users without tags. So with the malicious IAM user in place, permissions need to be defined so that the operator can access resources and services within the account. To achieve this, a new IAM group named SES Admin Group is created and the MS Baharis user is added to it. Legion then goes ahead and creates a policy based on the administrator access AWS managed policy and attaches it to this group. We can see an example of this in the create new policy function which is visible on this slide. So of course anyone working in cloud security knows that this, this essentially gives users within the group full access to all AWS services, including access to the management console itself providing that it's been enabled. Crucially, it also allows Legion operators to access AWS Simple Email Service, or SES, which of course is AWS's cloud SMTP service. So the function also includes some error handling to rename the assigned policy if it exists, and it achieves this by calling the Django get random string function and appending the resulting string to administrator access. Now, since we know Legion is concerned primarily with SMTP abuse, it should come as no surprise that the tool's next steps are to set up and interact with the SES service. The function on the slide here demonstrates the approach taken by the tool to set up an SES client via the AWS SDK for Python, which is of course Boto3. This function also performs additional configuration like setting the default AWS region and defining credentials. 
both of which are required to establish the Bolto 3 client. So of course, given the malicious IAM user is operating under permissions granted by the administrator access managed policy, there should be no barriers faced by the tool when attempting to access SES. And with this configuration in place, Legion's operator is now able to send emails and query account information, as we'll see on this next slide. So with the SES client established, Legion proceeds to query the send quota assigned to the compromised account. This is of course valuable information if your intention is to conduct spamming operations via SES. Legion's operator now knows how many outbound emails are permitted to be sent from this account and can use this for the benefit of their campaign. Information about the send quota can also be used to avoid detection in the environment by ensuring that the operator doesn't trigger any billing or quota alerts. So Legion also lists identities associated with the SES account and typically this would be email addresses or domains used to send the emails. So after these basic discovery operations, Legion then proceeds to send a test email which includes the result of the tool's automated discovery mechanisms in the body. Successful delivery of this email confirms to the operator that the AWS account has been compromised and that the malicious user has access to the SES service. So moving on now to discuss another notable feature of Legion. One thing that stood out to us during our analysis was the tool's ability to conduct SMS spamming via SMS over SMTP. To achieve this, the tool uses credentials exfiltrated via the methods described previously to access various automated communications platforms. Some of these tools provide SMS over SMTP support and Legion can leverage this to deliver spam SMS messages. So the tool targets various US mobile carriers, including AT&T, T-Mobile, and so on. Some of, the some of the carriers, sorry, are now defunct, suggesting that the code for this has been around for some time. So Legion uses an interesting method of generating alternative numbers to target via scraping area codes and carrier keys from the website randomphonenumbers.com. So we'll take a quick look at this on the next slide. To conduct the scraping, Legion uses simple Python scraping mechanism via the beautiful soup HTML parsing library. This allows the tool to retrieve carrier keys and area codes to which a series of digits can be added to make a, val a valid mobile number. Custom number generation code is used to create the rest of the mobile number. Similar to how the alphanumeric strings were added to the AKIA prefix for secret access key IDs. Now due to the significantly lower entropy associated with mobile numbers, this is much more likely to result in valid targets for the operator's campaign. Additional SMS hijacking functionality includes the ability to write out these numbers to a file for later use and Legion can also ingest predetermined carrier keys and area codes. An example of the carrier selection and SMS body code can be seen on this slide. So I mentioned in the overview of the tool that Legion includes some traditional hack tool functionality. And this included things like bundling exploits for web technologies like PHP. So let's examine these features in a bit more detail. Another thing that caught our attention during analysis of the was the bundling of an exploit of the CVE 2017-9841 vulnerability in PHP itself. Now, since I'm not expecting anyone here to remember CVE numbers off the top of their heads, I'll explain this vulnerability in a bit more detail. The vulnerability enables unauthenticated remote code execution via an HTTP POST request containing a PHP open tag substring. The post needs to be directed at publicly accessible resources within the slash vendor folder, specifically the eval standard in.php file. This allows arbitrary PHP code to be executed on the server itself 
and could be used for all kinds of nasty stuff like starting a reverse shell and retrieving additional payloads. Now, as with many things in the world of malware, it's reasonable to assume that the code for this exploit was lovingly repurposed, most likely from public proof of concepts released at the time of the vulnerability's discovery. It's unclear whether the Legion developer has some information to suggest this vulnerability is still common in the wild, or if they've simply included it as they're already targeting service running PHP. Regardless, an example of the exploit code can be seen on the slide here. Early in the function, you can see a hard-coded path to the eval standard in.php resource being assigned to a variable named path. Legion then defines a PHP info string before proceeding to build up the malicious payload. The Python request module is then used to deliver the string via an HTTP POST request, and the tool checks the response to see if the exploit was successful. Legion then proceeds to report the status of the exploit back to the operator. So with the core functionality out of the way, let's look at some changes we noticed in recent updates to this family of hack tools. So an interesting technique that's gaining popularity with the malware campaigns we analyze at Kado is the reporting of campaign statistics via Discord. This provides an easy way for attackers to programmatically report key information about their malware campaigns back to a centralized location. Furthermore, traffic designed for Discord is unlikely to be blocked in many environments. So in Legion's case, later variants utilize this technique to track and store campaign statistics that were traditionally reported via standard out or written to files on disk. This particular variant creates a Discord embed and populates it with values like the number of vulnerable sites discovered, number of successful RCEs, and the, number, and the total number of sites processed. And this is sent back via an HTTP POST request so that it can be displayed in the operator's channel of choice. SSH exploitation was another feature that appeared in some capacity in the original Legion sample that we encountered. However, it appeared like the developers had yet to finish the code for it. In all samples seen by Kado, code to parse a list of exfiltrated database credentials to extract username and password pairs was present. The tool attempted this using the environment file parsing ta technique we've already examined and looking for values like db underscore password. If these are found, recent samples use these credentials pairs in combination with a matching host value to attempt to log into the host over SSH. Now, of course, this assumes that the database credentials previously retrieved by the tool are being reused for SSH, which would be very stupid. So this seems unlikely to me, but I suppose you might as well try. So it also adds another feature to the tool that might make it more marketable to potential customers. So that's, just, that's us just about covered Legion now. So with that in mind, let's move on to our next malware campaign from an emerging crypto jacking group named DICOT. So DICOT are a group that we became acquainted with after discovering an interesting attack pattern on one of our honeypot sensors. They are malware as a service developers and are known for targeting Linux servers to conduct crypto jacking and other attacks. The group takes its name after the Romanian Organized Crime Police Unit, but they previously referred to themselves as Mexiles. If you go ahead and search for Mexiles, you'll find some research into prior campaigns conducted by this group, and we'll get an idea of their TTPs. So initial triage of the payloads retrieved from our honeypot allowed us to quickly attribute this campaign to DICOT, thanks to a number of excellent blogs by Bitdefender and Akamai. From there, investigation of their C2 server led to the discovery of a group of new payloads that hadn't yet been reported on. And this included a Mirai-based botnet agent, a self-propagating initial access tool, and a custom miner. Another interesting finding was the discovery of a video which included doxing of other online individuals that the group appeared to be feuding with. 
There was no discussion of DICOT's doxing abilities in previous research into this group's activities, so we thought that it would be useful to mention here. Several members of the rival group appear during the course of the video, and their personal details, including photographs, full names, home addresses, and online handles are exposed. It is suspected that the individuals in this video are members of a rival hacking group, but it wasn't clear what they'd done to anger Dicot in the first place. Text included in the video was written in the Romanian language, and the addresses were all located in Romania. And this fitted with our attribution, as that I believe that DICOT are a Romanian group. Now, DICOT's doxing capabilities are interesting, but it's malware in particular that we focus on, which leads me nicely to this graphic describing the execution flow of the campaign directed at our honeypot infrastructure. DICOT campaigns typically involve a long execution chain with multiple payloads and their outputs forming interdependent relationships. We've attempted to illustrate these relationships in this graphic, but I'll discuss them further detail in the, com in the coming slides. So as you can see from the graphic, the group uses a combination of ELFs written in Golang, which is a Linux attacker favorite, of course. They also use plain text shell scripts, regular compiled ELFs written in languages like C, and SHC ELFs, which are compiled shell scripts. Now, this can make analysis feel laborious, even in situations where the payloads themselves aren't particularly complex. It also demonstrates DICOT's awareness of the malware analysis process and their attempts to slow this down as much as possible. The group's campaigns contain some relatively distinctive TTPs, the first of these is the use of the UPX packer with a modified header. Typically, when packing an executable with UPX, a header is added which includes a magic byte sequence representing the letters U, P, and X, followed by an exclamation mark. This allows the executable to be unpacked with the UPX command line utility. A typical anti-unpacking measure is to modify this header so that it's no longer recognized as being packed by UPX by the utility. So this, of course, confuses the UPX CLI tool and prevents it from unpacking the binary. Now, fortunately, Akamai researcher Larry Cashdollar released an excellent tool named UPX DEC, which allows you to automatically locate and restore the modified bytes to the values that the UPX tool expects. With the binary repaired, you can then unpack it as normal. Now, this technique is certainly not unique to DICOT, but it gives an interesting insight into the group's capabilities. So moving on now to another obfuscation technique. I mentioned DICOT's use of SHC executables in the execution chain graphic a couple of slides previously. For those that don't know, SHC executables are essentially shell scripts compiled into an ELF. They are heavily utilized by DICOT for loaders, registering persistence, and preparing the target for mining via a custom fork of XM rig. It's likely that SHC is used for obfuscation purposes as it prevents the compiled script from being read in plain text. However, the resulting binaries didn't contain additional obfuscation, so were trivial to analyze. So this brings us back to a technique you'll remember was utilized by later versions of Legion, the use of Discord for campaign reporting. DICOT also make use of Discord for reporting campaign stats, and we identified four distinct channels used as part of this campaign. In this slide's example, we can see some decompiler output from a function in one of the campaign's primary payloads, which we'll come back to in a later slide. The function contains a curl request with a hard-coded Discord webhook URL. Now, generally, this function would be invoked after some system discovery procedures, with the results being sent in the post body. Further analysis showed that the channels were generated, likely by an automated method, within an 11-minute time frame on the 26th of April 2023, which was shortly before they no we noticed the activity in our honeypot. So each of the webhooks found in this payload of the campaign were used to send information about compromised machines back to Discord. 
Now, moving on to analysis of the payloads themselves, we focused our efforts on the payload named Aliases, which is a custom SSH brute forcing tool used for initial access in this campaign. Aliases is a 64-bit ELF written in Golang and is responsible for ingesting a list of target IPs and credentials to conduct a brute force attack. Shortly after execution, the sample will perform a GET request to an attacker run IP, API sorry, using a hard-coded API key. This hard-coded key appeared to be reused across DICOT samples and wasn't specific to a particular campaign. The API request returns with a Discord webhook URL, which seemed to be neglected in favor of the hard-coded hooks we mentioned earlier. Prior to the execution of aliases, an executable named Chrome is launched. Now, Chrome isn't particularly interesting from an analysis perspective, but it plays an important role in the campaign. Dynamic analysis quickly revealed that it was an internet scanner, most likely a fork of the popular internet scanner ZMAP. Now, since ZMAP is open source, it's very easy for attackers to customize it to add obfuscation or additional functionality. So DICOT's fork seemed relatively close in functionality to the original, with the only notable change being the ability to write out scan results to a file in the working directory, which were then ingested by aliases as a target list for brute forcing. So moving on now to look at some of the SHC executables utilized by DICOT. This first executable was a payload named Update, and it had a number of key responsibilities to ensure success of the campaign. Update acts as a loader, and its main purpose is to retrieve the Chrome payload we discussed in the previous slide. The sample also retrieves the alias's SSH brute forcer if it doesn't exist on the target. Now, payload, which confusingly is the actual name of this payload, is another SHC executable utilized by DICOT. Payload is mainly responsible for retrieving the XM rig miner and preparing the system for mining. The sample includes logic to only conduct minor related operations if the target has more than four processor cores. Payload also determines whether it's running under root and changes the root's password if so, before sending a JSON file named send.json back, which included the password. So with the payloads out of the way, I thought I'd include this recent finding that we made before we finish up. So during some unrelated darknet research, we encountered an onion link for a hidden service which was tagged with the DICOT name. Naturally, this caught our eye and we decided to take a closer look. We discovered this rather amusing homepage that you can see in the screenshot to the left of the slide. The homepage claimed to be the home of DICOT hackers and included some hilarious testimonies, an example of which can be seen on the right. Now, rather interestingly, the developers of this site had linked out to some press coverage of our research into DICOT, of which they seem to be proud of. Now, we think that this hidden service was most likely operated by an impersonator involved in scamming individuals wishing to contract the real DICOT for assistance in resolving extramarital affairs. However, it was an interesting and rather humorous finding nonetheless. So I think we perhaps are running out of time, so I'm going to skip over this just to give us a bit of a recap. So we've covered two recent malware campaigns analyzed by myself and my colleagues at Cado, and I hope that you all enjoyed hearing the findings. Now, if anyone has any questions, then please feel free to request a mic, and I'll answer them just now, or give me a shout on Twitter after the conference. So I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your time in Vegas, and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions so we can pass the mic around and everyone can hear? Everyone's ready to party. <laughs> well, I have a question then. Um, sure. You mentioned cloud and Linux. You can't really speak about that without mentioning Kubernetes. Have there been any findings in that area? Um, so there has been quite a lot of third party reporting of cloud attacks against Kubernetes. Um, I can't actually think of one off the top of my head, but I know that it exists. It's not something that we've seen personally. 
Um, but we have seen attacks against serverless environments. So we discovered Denonia last year, which was the first publicly um, reported uh, malware targeting uh, serverless environments specifically. Um, but yeah, we are yet to stumble on something that's Kubernetes specific. Hopefully we do though. That would be very cool. Well, thank you, Mayor. And Enjoy the rest of the conference, the last talk coming up. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.